In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. May the Lord bestow upon us his blessing, mercy, grace, and wisdom, now and ever to the age of all ages, amen. Uh, we're continuing our study in the Song of Songs, and now we're in chapter 2. And if you um, have uh, been with us before, we kind of went through um, the outline of the book as a whole. And the first two chapters to talk about um, in our relationship with our Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Bridegroom, uh, the first two chapters talk about our getting to know Him. Uh, as we know, after meeting someone and being intrigued with the idea of um, falling in love with them and, and, and marrying them, um, we need a few things first, right? We need to get to know them very well <laughs> before we can commit our whole heart and our whole life uh, to live with them. So the same can be said in our relationship with God. Um, yes, as children, many of us follow along uh, to according to what our parents uh, tell us, but at a certain point in time, we have to make that conviction for ourselves. We have to make the decision to, to not only follow God, but to love him for our whole uh, life. And so the ch second chapter here goes um, uh, through the story of the king who, um, in a sense, um, courts this, this simple girl who, for some reason or another, he loves. Um, and she gets to know him better at this time. And um, they converse with each other a lot in this chapter. And he basically proposes to her saying, I, I need you to come away with me. Um, <clears throat> and um, and the, the girl responds, yes, she be he belongs to me and I belong to him. Um, and so even when you look in scripture, uh, in the different relationships that the Lord has, uh, also during Lent, when in, in, in the Sunday Gospels, when we see how each individual has a special relationship with him and how he um, brings them to, to know him and to love him more. Um, this is, should, this is the same experience that should happen uh, to each and every one of us. <clears throat> so let's start. Um, the first few verses, the, broom, the, groom, the groom speaks, right? He, he describes himself. And the, the bride-to-be, um, instead of describing herself, she continues in this description. <clears throat> so what does he say? He says, I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Right? Um, and she responds saying, like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in the shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house. And his banner over me was love. We'll go into these verses um, uh, part by part because, as you can see, <laughs> it has to. The only explanation is the symbolism here. Um, when talking about trees and flowers and woods, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense if you if you take this literally. Um, and that's what we have been saying this whole time when we study this book. We can't take it literally. Um, we have to apply this one um, book in particular. Uh, with all the symbols and all the types and all the analogies to our relationship with God. Um, so uh, let's see how the fathers dissect this for us. Um, when the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys, like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Uh, this reminds us here of uh, the Psalms where where the soul is longing for um, f a fertile land, right? Um, like when, if we're in the desert and there's no water, right? There's no rest. As the Psalm uh, 62 says, um, or 63, uh, in, uh, in the first hour of the Agbeya. The fathers tell us here that um, usually when you come to plant anything, um, flowers or, or um, fruits or whatever, it should be in a field, not in a valley. Um, <clears throat> and so Origen says that this reminds us of the Gentiles because they were uncultivated by the law and the prophets, in a sense. Um, they didn't have Christ yet. 
But um, the place of Sharon was very fertile valley of Judea, and it had the best, plant best plantations, um, which required minimal effort. So here we say um, the Lord is seeing us as a very good plant plantation, not because we put the effort, but because of the grace of God, because of his grace that he shined upon us. Right? And uh, Jerome says, the lily buddy budded from the rod in the wilderness, right? The, the, the flower um, came forth from, you know, a, a place or a, a tree that was not um, expecting to bear fruit, right? Um, just like the Holy Virgin gave birth to the Savior, right? And um, as you know, this is the symbol of, of the incarnation um, where Aaron's rod budded and brought forth um, fruit without seed, without, um, and so the Holy Virgin gave birth to Christ without the seed of man. Okay. Um, and then on top of this, the flower says that gives beautiful aroma, but not just um, from the tree, but when you take it and what happens when you slice it and you cut it and you crush it, like when you crucify the Lord, um, does the aroma stop? No, on the contrary, it gives even more beautiful aroma. Um, when Christ was crucified, he gave us the, the, the new life. Um, <clears throat> and he crushed death at the same time um, by his death. Um, and what do the thorns remind us? It reminds us of the, of the curse uh, in Genesis because of the disobedience and the fall. There, um, the Lord God said to Adam and Eve, or to Adam, when you, when you till the ground, thorns and thistles it will give for you. It's it's part of the consequence of your sin. And what did the Lord do with with this punishment? In a sense, He put it on His head. He said, "This is my crown. I will take this punishment um, for my beloved, so that we can um, wed without any barriers between us. There's no more barrenness, no more punishment, no more death. Um, only life, only beauty, only power, only the aroma of Christ." Um, and that's why when he says, I am the lily of the valleys, um, the lily among thorns, I am the, the righteous among sin, um, it's okay. It's okay because he has come to remove the thorns. Okay, um, And the symbolism continues. Right? He, he says here, I'm also like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, or like among the sticks, where there's no fruit, where there's no shade, where, where there's no um, fertility. I am, I am the source of shade. I am the source of the fruit. I am the source of the beautiful aroma. Um, this is how I am among the sons. Okay. Um, and Origen says the bridegroom is among the sons, as Christ is among humanity. Therefore, as the apple tree among the the trees that have no fruit, um, in that he bears fruit, which not only surpasses other fruits in taste, but also in fragrance. Um, the sweet and pleasant doctrine. So sometimes this uh, is exemplified in um, the sacrifice of Christ, and sometimes it's also the teachings of Christ. Um, and the, the fathers use this interchangeably. And as we said, the trees of the woods, they don't give us any rest. Um, so this is the acts of man, or the, the consequence, again, of, of the fall, um, <clears throat> or the wrong teaching. Which, which does not bring rest or shade. Um, so uh, the, what, is the, what does the shade have to do with anything here? Um, we mentioned it uh, last time a little bit, um, but you know when we say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you see the valley and the shadow and the death, but you are with me, right? This, the, the valley of the shadow of death, that's the consequence of man. That's a consequence of sin. But... Um, the, the lily and the fruit and the apple tree and the shadow or the shade that brings rest, that's Christ, right? So, um, so the bride speaks now and says, I sat down in a shade with great delight and his fruit was sweet to my taste. This is the voice of the one who enjoys being with the Lord and has experienced um, sweetness when, when, they, when they taste and see that the Lord is good. Um, and many of us have experienced this once or twice, but we want to 
experience this continually. And, and that's why the psalmist says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. Right? So this, this symbol of the shadow or o being overshadowed um, is very prevalent in the scripture, but sometimes we, we don't realize. And so we're hiding under the tree of the, or the shadow of his wings when he spread out his hands on the cross uh, for us. Um, and when the Holy Virgin asks the Archangel, H how can I give birth? Right? How, how is this going to happen? Um, uh, he explains the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. Right? Um, and in the Feast of the Transfiguration, what happened? Um, a, a bright cloud, which doesn't make sense, right? A bright cloud came and overshadowed them, um, not to protect them from the glory of God, but to reveal the gl glory of God um, and to protect from, from the, um, the heat of the sun or from the consequence of sin, right? <clears throat> and in Hebrews, St. Paul alludes to this as well uh, a couple of times, and he's saying uh, the law having the shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things. So the shadow comes before the real thing. Um, right, so uh, we have um, uh, a tiny experience of the glory of God on the Feast of the Transfiguration um, that will be revealed and perfected and completed when we are face to face with our beloved in the heavenly kingdom. Right, the glory of God was only you know uh, revealed you know, maybe less than one percent of His glory to His disciples, but it was amazing to them. Right. It's more of like, uh, you know, stay tuned until you see even more things to come. So this is the shadow of life, not the shadow of death. Uh, the shadow of God gives life, protection, blessing, um, preparation for even better things to come, um, and a forgiveness. Okay, um, And then now the Shulamite speaks in verse 4, says, uh, says to her friends, the daughters of Jerusalem, um, he brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. So, again, this is not necessarily chronological. It doesn't make sense where she's looking for them, and then she speaks to him, and then she's looking for him, and then um, they're going to the reception hall, and, and then they get married. Um, of course, this applies to, you know, our spiritual struggle and relationship with God. It's not perfected yet. It's not complete yet, um, but we're going, we're having our ups and downs. So what's the banqueting house here? Not, nothing else but the church, right? What is the banner over me that's love? This is where the Lord and the church uh, is, is celebrating, and the feast here um, is the sacrament, is most likely of the Holy Eucharist, right? And the banner is like, you know, when you go into a house and the house says, okay, these are the rules of the house. Or when you go into a courtroom, these are this is the law of uh, the land, right? And so, uh, what is the main law that we have uh, with the Lord? Just love. Uh, just, just love me and love your fellow man. All the commandments are summed up in this. This is what the Lord said here in, the, in this passage from the Gospel. Um, and he alludes to Deuteronomy, which the Lord God already had set in, in, uh, before the, the Lord Jesus Christ came uh, and took flesh. Um, so what's the main rule of your life? Love. Just love God. Um, and when you love God, you're able to love your fellow man. And when you love your fellow man, you have already fulfilled the rest of the commandments. Um, so this is how he breaks it down. The banner uh, over me was love. God only wants to tell me that he loves me, and he only wants me to love back. Um, and when I do, I'm in heaven. <laughs> I am with my groom. Uh, <clears throat> then she says um, to her bride, uh, or bridal party, um, I, I'm lovesick, <laughs> or in another translation, I'm wounded with love. Why? Because he's he's not always with me every second, and I can't handle it. <laughs> um, so she's like, okay, sustain me with with the apples from the apple tree. Um, sustain me with the cakes of raisins. Um, uh, I, I need to be with him, and and it's tearing me up that I'm not as close as I want to be. All of us, I think, at, at one point in our spiritual life, we feel this. Um, we've, we've already fell in love with, with our, our groom, but we, we feel far, and it's not his fault, it's our fault. Um, 
and saint augustine says well okay if if we are wounded with love well, when is this wound he healed when our desire is satisfied when when he's there when the good things come when when i experience the grace of god and the lily of the valleys um and he says it's called a wound as long as we desire and don't have um right when we're hungry we're starving <laughs> right um and we, we won't be satisfied until we eat right love is the same thing as if it were a pain sometimes when we get there when we have what we desire the pain disappears the love doesn't cease and actually this can be said about uh, lust to an extent but um it's it's never satisfied and it's that's that's not the proper description of love as we'll see in a minute um <clears throat> but she's desiring the lord and we ask also from the servants of of the lord pour the love of christ inside me give me the sacrament give me of of, of communion refresh me with with the body of christ um uh, and this is this the source of my revival this is the source of my union with the lord um then another beautiful verse his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me um uh, again this is symbolic and and saint cyril and, and his origin and a lot of the fathers explain what does the left and the right have to do with it um so the left is what supports um and the right is what loves um and and what does it support the head the thoughts uh the understanding um the the things of this world right but the right hand is is expressing the love so the left hand is the law the the right hand is the law of love or the gospel the left hand is the, the things in this life that we need the Lord to help us sustain and give us the necessities or the worldly knowledge or the physical needs. And the right hand is, is the things of the, the next life, the wisdom, the spiritual deeds, um, the, the law of love. And so um, we need both, right? We need um, both uh, the support in this life, but more importantly, the the kingdom of heaven um so when we seek the kingdom of heaven all these things shall be added to us when we seek the right hand the left hand is there supporting me um <clears throat> under my head so this is the beauty of of what this verse is not just a, a nice verse about you know a husband and wife hugging <laughs> much more than that okay um then she says something very unique um she tells her friends um do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And maybe this this verse is um, improperly translated. It's it's possible because the fathers explain this a different way. But I, I use this verse a lot when I'm <laughs> counseling those who are preparing for marriage um, or who are even much farther than that, right? When they start uh, dating inappropriately or too early, say, okay, this verse applies to you. <laughs> um, you're saying you love, but it, it's it, it's not pleasing God. It's not the right time. Um, and love is patient, right? Um, and if it's truly the person you're going to marry in 10 years, <laughs> then you need to be patient. Um, uh, no, but I have to have it now. That That's not love. <laughs> um, and um, But what the fathers more uh, explain this verse, uh, it's, it's similar, I think, to what St. Paul says to his disciple, St. Timothy. He says, I, do I ordained you with the laying on of my hands, and I gave you the sacrament of the priesthood. Um, you ordained him as a bishop, right? Um, but that's not the end of the story. Um, if, if you want to please God and serve God appropriately, you have to stir up that spirit within you. Um, stir up the gift of God, which is in you, uh, through the laying on of my hands. Um, so it starts with, the Holy Spirit that that I that He placed inside of you, that God placed inside of you, but you need to work with Him. You need to let Him work in you. Um, and so the Father say, this is the same thing with the love that God has placed inside of us. So the kingdom of God is in you. But what are you doing with it? Are you stirring up the Spirit of God to do good works, to follow the commandment, to at least try to uh, f f struggle against sin? Um, when you stir that spirit up, then there's power. Um, but don't lay, let it lay dormant in, inside of us. Um, so we have to do our part. 
Of course, the grace of God is in us um, to forgive sins. But are we struggling against sin until bloodshed um, or not? Um, and then uh, the fathers explain what the, says by the gazelles or the does of the field. The field here is us. We are the field. You are God's field. You are God's building, as St. Um, Paul says. Um, meaning um, this is the, the, the faith of the church and the way of life. Um, and if, if we want to bear fruit, we let the Lord uh, plant the good seed in us and we till the field uh, so that it produces good fruit. It's not just about the seed, but also about the heart. Uh, okay, so um, then, again, she's not with him face to face just in the next verse. So <laughs> you see the analogy here. So now she's explaining him as, okay, I hear him coming. The voice of my beloved, he's coming. He's, he's leaping on the mountains. Now he's not a person. He's um, uh, symbolized as, as a gazelle. <laughs> Um, skipping on the hills and leaping upon the mountains. Um, of course, uh, the His Holiness Pope Shenouda, blessed memory, has a whole chapter about how we hear the voice of our beloved. Um, and he says, notice, she she's saying that she hears from far. Um, she senses his coming, and she's awaiting his coming with perseverance. Like John the Baptist, she he just heard the voice. Not e He wasn't even born yet. And he heard the voice of his mother, and he leapt for joy in the womb. Um, this is how we have to be. I hear the voice, and it gives me comfort and joy, and, and I can't control myself. Um, and uh, what are the mountains here? Um, uh, well, let's look in Scripture. The, again, th there's tons we can say about just the, the mountains here. Um, but uh, one thing, they're for retreat and for defeat, right? or defeating, um, like the gospel of today, when the Lord went on the Mount of Temptation um, to be tempted, but to, to defeat Satan, you know, um, and all the temptations he had to offer, right? Um, Elijah the prophet and the Lord himself went on the mountain to retreat for prayer and for um, uh, to be with God, right? Um, it's going up to the high place. This, this is why the mountain is symbolic of of the church. We also go to the mountain, right, to hear the Sermon on the Mount, or to be fed um, with, with the Lord when he fed the multitudes. So um, this is the place when we're with our beloved, we learn from him, and we take the bread of life. Um, but also, the bread of life is, is, or the communion could not happen without the sacrifice. So the Lord went up on the mountain to sacrifice himself on Golgotha. Um, and he also went on the mountain to reveal himself in the Mount of Transfiguration. So mountains here, when we see this in scripture, it's it's one or all of these um, symbols that we mentioned. Um, <clears throat> so what does the Lord say? Um, what is the main message? Not besides, I love you. Because I love you, I need you to rise. I need you to come away with me. Um, I, I am calling you to the resurrection and the resurrected life and the transformed life and the transfigured life. Leave the worldly things, follow the heavenly one. Um, don't do it by yourself, do it with me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Origen says, why is he speaking through the window and the lattice? It was a few verses ago. Um, he's saying the word of God speaks to the beautiful soul and appears to her through the readings of scripture. Right? When we read scripture, we, we hear the Lord telling us, you know, rise. Um, why through windows? Um, because she's not there yet. There's there's a barrier. The barrier is not from him. The barrier is from us, our our sin and our and our um, the the consequences of of the sins that we have committed separate us from God. But he sees us, and we see a glimpse of him. We have to leave the house. We have to leave the sin, and and rise with him. Um, so, but the Lord comes very uh, humbly. And tenderly, and he bows to her. He says, Look, just, just come away with me. Um, <clears throat> how beautiful is, is the Lord and his message, um, gently saying, Just leave this in, just come with me. Um, it's not like the, uh, the bully who's saying, No, you did this wrong, punish, you know, uh, 
just you you can't come with me unless you finish this like no he's not saying this as you know um as a police officer he's saying this as the beloved i, I don't want you to be attached to the sin um <clears throat> it's not helpful for you or for me we can't be very close if you're still there let me wash it away for you um he says now comes the few verses where but i'm suffering lord i i'm in the darkness i'm in the winter i'm in in the cold right um and then the lord says no uh yes you're in the winter but now is the time he says the winter's past the rain is over and gone the flowers appear on the earth the time of singing has come the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land the fig tree puts forth her green figs the vines with their tender grapes give a good smell um the winter is the time where we don't have our beloved where we don't feel the presence of our beloved when we are realizing the coldness and the darkness and the death uh, from our sin and when we just feel separated from god because of it but then he has come right the the the, the past has come the resurrection has come the pardon the forgiveness the temptation the the storm the affliction, the suffering, as Ambrose says, all of that has gone away. That's the winter. Now is Christ. Now is his coming where there's flowers and um, uh, the rain is gone. And there is the voice of the turtle dove. We'll get to the turtle dove in, in a few chapters. Um, and now there's fruit and shade and sweet smell fragrance. So whenever we feel that we're in the winter, we have to remember the spring is coming. Whenever we feel the suffering, we have to remind ourselves that this is, this will pass, um, and the spring shall come. Just have to endure uh, for a moment. And the Lord knows how much we can endure. And, and, and once we can't endure anymore, then the spring comes. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, though, we think our capacity is less than what it is. Um, so don't doubt that the Lord is not seeing and not hearing and not um, uh, compassionate for you. He is. But sometimes we, so we need the winter sometimes. We need the rain or else there'll be no flowers. right? We need the suffering or else there'll be no reward. Um, or the, sometimes the suffering helps because it, it, it purifies us from allowing us to leave the things that are not essential. Um, and what is his desire for us? Um, he wants to hear our voice. He wants to see our face, just like we want to see his face and to hear his voice. Um, even though he, he's the one who is lovely, he's saying this to us. Um, and even though he is the dove, he's calling us. Like This is the beauty of the, the two who love one another. They start talking like each other. They start acting like each other. They start even looking sometimes like each other. right? And this is... This is our goal as a Christians to be Christ-like, right? Um, so sometimes even when you see someone speaking, you don't know is this the bride or the groom who's speaking, and 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 um, even sometimes the commentators um, mistakenly um, attribute one of these verses to someone, and sometimes it's okay because it it can go both ways. Uh, but of course we go with the fathers and see, you know. Um, who is actually speaking. Nevertheless, the Lord is saying, I need you to come to the clefts of the rock. What is the cleft of the rock? What is the secret place in the cliff? Um, well, the high place, we already explained that, right? But go to the story of Moses in Exodus. Uh, it's a very um, uh, com beautiful uh, comparison, or I, I think it's this is this is what it has to be referring to. Why? Because <clears throat> Moses wanted to see the glory of God. He, he couldn't get enough of him, even though God appeared to him many times, like in the burning bush and, and, and whatnot, and up in the mountain. It's like, but I need, I need more of your glory. Just give me a taste of the transfiguration. So God said, okay, um, go into the cleft of the rock, um, and I will pass by. My glory will pass by. Um, you will not see everything. You will not see my face. He said, you can't, you can't see my face yet, right? Um, but I will cover you with my hand when I pass by. Um, this is, in a sense, how we should try to wrestle with God saying, just give me a little bit more. I, I need 
I need this. I'm going to go into the cleft of the rock and, and pass by um, with your glory. Um, sustain me a little more with, with your presence. Uh, I know, hopefully, what's awaiting me um, with, with the, the complete glory will, will be amazing on that last day, but I can't wait until then. Just give me a taste. Um, and the, the Lord desires to give you a taste of that as well. Um, <clears throat> so then, after this experience, the, the commitment is, is starting to increase with, with the, the bride. She says, my beloved is mine and I am his. I belong to him, he belongs to me. Um, and and I, I will be fed like he feeds his flock uh, among the lilies. Um, and the bride knows where to find the groom in the church. She knows that he remains close to the saints who are always praying, the, the, the flock, right? And she knows that he's feeding his, his flock. Um, and so we go to, to basically renew our vows with our beloved, saying, my beloved is mine and I am his. And this kind of reminds me of the commandments that um, the, the bishop or the priest gives to the, to the newly wed uh, bride and groom on the day of their wedding and marriage um, and crowning. Uh, they remind each other of the verse that St. Paul says, it says, when, when the Lord is marrying you, your body is not your own. Even f before marriage, our body belongs to God, right? But it says, but now that you're married, you, you not only have to give yourself to God, you have to give yourself to this person that you are committing the rest of your life to. Um, you don't have authority as much over yourself, um, as but God does. And even your spouse has uh, some authority. Um and when we so then we begin to submit one another to one another in love. It's not just applicable to the bride for for the groom, but also the groom for the bride. Here we're talking about you know uh, husband and wife, because <laughs> um, God has authority over all. Um, so um, so that's why if if we go into a marital relationship with this mentality, then um, the, the the marriage will be very fruitful and successful um, because we're going going in with humility with the the concept of submission and sacrifice and um, you have a right to tell me this you like you have authority God gave you authority to to help me but we don't abuse that authority or else it won't be it won't be called love um, anyway that's more for another time but this is when we say hey, my beloved is mine and I'm his it's it's a commitment and it's an understanding of how I'm giving all to, to the person I love because he has given all to me. Um, uh, may the Lord God give us this experience or at least little glimpses and tastes of this um, in our in our life so we, we feel his presence more and more. Glory be to him now and from to the age of all ages. Amen. God willing, next time we'll start uh, chapter 3 and go um, more into this. So we'll find the bride again saying, you know, where is he? I need to search for him. Um, and so stay tuned till next time. May God bless.